Welcome everyone. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're watching this pre-recorded webinar. This is an estate planning webinar presented by the Gregory Law Firm. I'm Steve Gregory, and uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, get started with the webinar. So I call this webinar estate planning, what every and I've crossed out parent, and every person needs to know. Uh, to some extent, this webinar is focused on parents because there are various things that parents of small children ought to do, uh, probably know they need to do with regard to estate planning. But most of it really applies for everyone. And uh, if you're watching this, you may be watching it on my website, the gregorylawfirm.us website. You could be watching it on the Gregory Law Firm's YouTube channel. We'll probably also post it on Facebook and on Instagram. But at any rate, welcome. And we'll uh, move along to the, uh, to the uh, first slide. I have maximized my screen. And I hope that everyone sees that well. And Let's get started. Estate planning for busy parents and everyone else, because as my tagline on my website indicates, estate planning is really for everyone. If you're over 18, whether you have significant assets or none, you probably need to do at least some simple things with regard to estate planning. Most of us need to do a lot more. So for the next hour, I wanna share what probably no one has ever told you about estate planning. So just sit back, have a cup of coffee or a mug of tea, and let's talk about estate planning. You may want to turn off your phone. You may want to stop surfing the internet. Take this time for yourself, and let's help you uh, determine what you need to do with your estate plan. Um, Gregory Law Firm and I uh, are members of Wealth Council. Wealth Council is a an organization of hundreds of estate planners, estate planning attorneys with uh, thousands, possibly even millions of pages of information and lots of potential co-counsel around the country who share ideas and approaches to estate planning. A little bit about me. This is, uh, these are some of my uh, credits. You can look at those as you wish. Um, and uh, I'll take just a minute to share that, that screen, but let's go ahead and dig into what we'll be doing. So what you'll learn today is, for example, how to, how to name guardians for your minor children. Um, you can't do that unless you have some sort of estate plan. Otherwise, a court will do it for you in the event that you and your spouse uh, are gone and you still have minor children. A court will appoint guardians unless you've already done so. Another thing you'll learn today is how to avoid probate court and what your options are with regard to estate planning. You'll learn the difference between a will and a trust. And you'll learn that trusts aren't only for wealthy people. They provide advantages for everybody and everyone ought to really consider the possibility at least of the trust versus the will approach to estate planning. We can also talk about how to protect your children's inheritance in many different ways. Uh, one of the primary issues is that you don't want your children to inherit your entire estate when they're 18 years old, and you certainly don't want them to inherit it when they're five or seven years old. So we're going to start talking about how to start your own estate plan, what's involved in doing that, and eventually we'll talk about how much it costs to do that. So I sometimes hear some doubts about estate planning. For example, that planning for your death will somehow hasten its occurrence. But I can assure you that won't happen. But it will take too long. Well, no, it will only take a few hours, uh, including this hour or so. And you do have enough time. And that you're not old enough or wealthy enough I just talked about the fact that almost every adult needs some form of estate planning. 
even if it's just uh, designating uh, persons to make decisions for you in the event of incapacity, or even if it's just um, having somebody have a durable power of attorney for you, um, if you're a young person and you really don't have many assets, you still need those documents. You're not old enough or wealthy enough. Well, yes, you probably are. Um, so the good news about this is I've never had a client pass away just because they just initiated their estate plan. You really owe it to future generations, to your loved ones who are with you now to make sure they're protected. And the benefits of estate planning are really not tied to age or wealth or parental or marital status. It's not about you really, it's about protecting the people around you, the people you love. So what are the goals of estate planning? You can give what you have when you want to give it, the way you want to give it, in the form you want to give it, and when you want to give it. Importantly, you can avoid probate court. You can maximize the assets that are available to your loved ones by, for example, minimizing taxes. If you're in a tax bracket where estate taxes could be an issue, and you could also minimize the costs of settling your estate. But in addition to that, you can also determine ways to provide for your own incapacity so that someone can help make decisions for you if in the event you're not able to do so yourself. If you have interest in charity or if you want to use charity for tax planning purposes, you can do that. Uh, we talked about minimizing taxes. And of course, estate planning is largely about caring for others. I'm looking down in the lower left corner now, uh, you can pass on your values and your ideals to your children and your grandchildren. And you can protect assets from creditors, from divorce court, from bankruptcy, uh, not just for yourself, but for generations to come. So here's a question, and I bet you haven't considered it, maybe. And that is, do you currently have an estate plan? You say, well, no, I haven't really done anything. That's why I'm watching this webinar. But if you haven't done anything about an estate plan, in fact, you may think that you don't have an estate plan, but the state of Alabama or the state of Tennessee, if you're watching this in Tennessee, has written an estate plan for you. It's called the law of intestacy. I'm not going into the specifics of the laws of intestacy because that's beyond the scope of this webinar, but what estate planning really is, is opting out of the default plan that the state has created for you, uh, for your family and your assets. What are the downsides to dying without a will or without a living trust? Dying intestate, as we say. Well, as I mentioned, assets are going to be distributed according to state law, which may not be what you want. Your children will get, will receive their inheritance at age 18, and they will receive it at that time outright. Not in a trust, not with a guardian, they will just receive the money. And they could lose that money later in a divorce. They could use, lose it in bankruptcy, uh, or they could spend it, all of it at once even, which you probably don't want. Additionally, your spouse could remarry after your death and leave money to a new spouse and other children. As I mentioned earlier, if you die without a will, a judge will decide who raises your minor children. A judge will decide who is in charge of your minor children's funds. Um, and of course, dying intestate guarantees that you will go through, your estate will go through probate court. By the way, that's also true if you use a will as your primary estate planning vehicle. So what would happen today if your children to your children if something happened to you. Well, we talked about that for a minute, but as I said, if you don't have a plan, there is a default plan, the state's plan, but you probably won't like it. And a judge would decide who gets custody of your children in a permanent guardianship proceeding, which 
follows the law, which may be complex, which may be expensive, and unfortunately, which may be lengthy. In-laws may battle for custody and leave the court to sort out the mess. And of course, by the way, judges hate to do this kind of work, but it's what they were elected for, so they will. The solution to uh, intestacy is to name, name your guardians, your children's guardians in a will. Now, most people name a couple as guardians, but you have to be careful about that because you also have to say in your will or in your uh, other documents, what happens if they divorce or if one of them dies. So you have to nominate or you should nominate backups in case your first choice isn't available. So then aside from providing for guardians for your children, what about your assets? What happens to them? Well, let's back up and talk about what an estate actually is. It actually has several buckets, if you want to call it, or smaller buckets that go into the big bucket of an estate. It's cash that you have in your house or somewhere that you are keeping aside, maybe in a safe deposit box. It's bank accounts, checking accounts, savings accounts, items like cars or boats or motorcycles, brokerage accounts, of course, life insurance proceeds, any real estate that you own, retirement assets such as 401ks or IRAs, collectibles, coin collections, uh, jewelry or artwork, and intellectual property and business interests. For example, if you own an interest in an LLC or if you own a business, uh, if it's a C corporation or an S corporation, that's part of your estate as well. And of course, the implication of my last point there is that title equals ownership. Title is important. And there are three ways you can own property at the time of your death. You can own it individually, just in your name. For example, a bank account that you own in your name alone. You can only join a, a, an asset jointly with two or more owners. For example, where a bank account is held in joint tenancy with the right of survivorship. Or you might own a bank account. This would be unusual, but you might own a bank account as tenants in common or by contract, for example, in a life insurance contract uh, or uh, an annuity or some uh, other asset of that sort where some money is going to be payable to your spouse or to your children or someone else uh, when you die. So there is a risk with jointly owned assets. It's true that most people, of course, probably have a joint bank account, probably own title to their real estate, their home, jointly with their spouse. But And that avoids probate when the first owner dies because immediately by operation of law and by operation of the agreement that the joint tenancy creates, the other owner receives that asset without probate. Jointly owned assets don't go through probate. Um, but when the second owner dies, then you still, those assets are still going to have to be probated. So there's another risk with beneficiary designations, and that is that you can't name a minor child as a beneficiary. I actually had a lawyer, another lawyer tell me the other day that when she went to see an estate planning attorney, she actually had made her five-year-old daughter the beneficiary of her IRA. And she was told quite quickly that, oh, that wasn't really very smart, although that wasn't the word the other lawyer used. Um, because you're going to have, what's going to happen if you do that is the, a court is going to have to name a guardian for those assets. They can't, uh, a minor child can't actually own or receive uh, retirement assets. So uh, also, even if the child is over 18, those proceeds are going to be paid without rules or guardrails. That is, they're going to get all the money at once and they can do whatever they want with it. Many estate plans fail. 
Estate plans fail because document, documents are poorly drafted. Uh, documents downloaded from the internet are almost guaranteed to be poorly drafted because they're not drafted for you. They're just drafted generically. Most estate plans fail because if the intention was to avoid probate, they don't. Estate plans need to be updated from time to time when things change, when children are born, when grandchildren are born, when somebody gets divorced or remarries, all kinds of life events mean that, that estate plans need to be changed. And another reason that I just alluded to a minute ago is you don't want, probably, you don't want your children to get their entire inheritance at the age of 18. For obvious reasons, they could spend it uh, unwisely, but also uh, it may not be protected from divorce, bankruptcy, or from a lawsuit when it could have been with a, with a carefully drafted estate plan. So what are the options? Well, I'm sure you're aware that Option one is a last will and testament. Everybody probably knows about those. But option two is a revocable living trust. And as I've mentioned before, those are not just for wealthy people at all. The last will and testament is certainly better than intestacy. And in the last will and testament, you're going to nominate, you can nominate guardians for your children. You can nominate beneficiaries for assets owned by you individually, and you can name an executor to wrap up your affairs. Almost In almost every instance, you should also name a contingent executor in case that executor can't, that first executor can't serve or, or doesn't want to serve. But there are downsides to wills. For one, they have to go through probate court. And so you lose all privacy. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But uh, when a will is filed in probate court, it becomes a public document. Also, a will cannot provide for incapacity. It cannot provide for disability. The reason for that is it doesn't really come into being or speak until the death of the person who makes the will. Wills can sometimes be pro problematic if you have property in another state, or if you decide to move to another state, the will you drafted in Alabama might not be enforceable in Colorado, for example, or vice versa. And I mentioned several times that if the children get money when they're 18 years old, that's probably a mistake. Also, wills don't really control most of your property. They don't control jointly owned real estate uh, in a joint tenancy with the right of, right of survivorship, the real estate automatically goes to the, the survivor, not uh, through, the, through, the, through the probate estate. They don't control retirement accounts. They don't control life insurance. Um, so they don't really speak or they don't really help you during your life. They also don't really help you during the succeeding lives of your surviving spouse, your children, or your grandchildren. And as I mentioned, where there's a will, there's a probate. And you have to go through that process, whether you like it or not, or your estate does. And your, your loved ones are probably going to be frustrated by it because of the length of time it takes uh, more than anything else. And the two states in which I practice, Alabama and Tennessee, the fees for probating a will are not excessive as they are in some other states, but you may end up paying uh, some uh, substantial attorney's fees. So the court will appoint the executor in probate court, publish a notice in the newspapers so that creditors can make claims. The court will inventory and appraise assets, distribute any assets that are left, and as I mentioned, everything is reported, everything is public. The, uh, the survivors will probably have to hire, the executor may have to hire a lawyer to help probate the estate. So those are three downsides to probate that I've been talking about. 
And even in Alabama and Tennessee, where probate, again, is not terribly expensive in terms of the fees that you have to pay to the probate court, you may have to pay some attorney fees and you still may, may end up paying maybe maybe 2% of the of value of the estate in fees. So let's say your home, as in this example, is worth $1.8 million, where you have a $400,000 home, a rental property, some stocks and bonds, life insurance, part of your probate estate, and a 401k. Uh, so that's $1.8 million. 2% of that is $36,000. So you end up you potentially end up paying attorney's fees in that amount. And that's a pretty substantial sum that your survivors would not have had to pay had you used a different approach. And I'm sure you don't have money to burn, but also probate can be time consuming, even in Alabama and Tennessee. Assets may be frozen until the judge releases them. Wills are public. Anyone can go and look at it. And that may not bother you too much. But if you're leaving assets to uh, minor children uh, with guardians or financial guardians, uh, custodians, uh, holding the, the reins to those assets, since your will is public, anyone in the public can see what you left to those minor children. And that might not be something you particularly want. Now, I mentioned that wills are public, and this is an example I like to use. This is an excerpt from the first page of the last will and testament of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. She used a will, it's her primary estate planning vehicle, and it's a, it's a sophisticated estate plan. Nevertheless, it is a will and it is public, and you can see how she dealt with every single asset that she owned, what, how uh, she dealt with them, uh, who she left them to. Uh, you can see Maurice Templesman, her, her friend, Bunny Meller, Mellon, her friend, and others. Um, you can see later on in the will, this is just the first page, that she left substantial sums to her nieces and nephews who were the children of her sister, Lee Radswell. So, but when is a will-based plan appropriate? Um, well, estates less than $34,611, don't ask me how they came up with that number, in Alabama are eligible for a simplified probate process. It is easy and inexpensive, and so that's probably not a bad idea with a small estate uh, in Alabama. So a will may not be the answer for you and you may decide it isn't. And that's really the, one of the purposes of my doing this webinar so that you can make your own decision. So for many people, a better option may be a revocable living trust. So what does that do? Well, most of the problems with wills are solved. The living trust is private. You can name beneficiaries for your assets in the trust. The, uh, the trust is revocable. You can make changes in the trust. You can make changes with regard to, to the ownership of the property in the trust. You can change it or amend it at some point. And you are the trustee. You, the trust maker, are in control of the trust during your lifetime. So how do you do this? Everything presently that you own, unless you already have a revocable living trust, everything you own now is outside of your trust. Create the trust and then move your assets into the trust by retitling them. This is a point that estate and trust lawyers can't and don't, well, they, they don't fail to emphasize too much or enough because you have to retitle your assets and put them into the trust. Otherwise, you haven't actually accomplished anything. So if you create a revocable living trust, you're going to retitle your bank accounts, you're going to retitle, uh, um, create new deeds for your, for your real estate and so forth. Put all those assets into the trust. Uh, 
And, and so you will still be retaining control of the trust. And everything in the trust then uh, at your death bypasses probate. Trusts are not only for wealthy people, like the fella, I guess, who's there on a private aircraft. Um, there's an article in Forbes about this, and there's a, a link to it. If you're quick enough, you can either take a screenshot or, or, or write that down. But I actually have an excerpt from it here. Contrary to popular perception, you don't have to be wealthy to set up a trust fund. Net worth is a very small component when considering whether to establish a trust fund in the estate plan. The key determinants are your goals in your estate plan and then to understand whether a trust fund or a trust will help accomplish those goals. If one of your goals is privacy, if one of your goals is providing a way to allow your minor children to uh, receive the assets that you've accumulated over a graduated period of time instead of just all at once, then you're well on your way to making the decision that a revocable living trust is actually better for you. A trust is just an agreement that spells out the rules you want followed for the assets in trust. So here's an example. If Bob has $100,000 in a bank account to leave to his son, Fred, but before, he, before Fred has access to that money, he wants Fred to be at least 25 and graduate from college. You can't do that in a will, uh, or at least not very effectively. You need a trust. Now, in a will, you could do it uh, through, what's, through what's called a testamentary trust, but um, that's just going a long way around to do something that you could do in a straight way through by just creating a, a living trust. So there are three roles in every revocable living trust, a grantor, or I like to call it the trust maker because that's a straightforward forward, uh, word. That's the person who contributes the assets to the trust. In the case of a married couple, it's usually, of course, both of them creating a, a joint trust, depending on their situation. There may be situations where a married couple will want to create two trusts, and that's something we could talk about at a planning meeting. The trustee, that's the person who manages the trust assets. That's usually in the, initially the same person as the grantor or trust maker. And then of course, the beneficiary or beneficiaries, the person or persons who are entitled to the assets when the trust makers have died. So how do you hold title? Well, the trust will hold the title. And that's what I was talking about a minute ago. You need to transfer title to the trust after you create the trust. So a revocable living trust is kind of like a child's backpack. It avoids probate for all the things that are inside the backpack. You don't wanna leave that backpack after you create the trust. You don't want to leave it empty. You have to fund the trust. You have to transfer assets to the trust, retitle assets into the trust uh, in this manner. That's also called, excuse me, that's also called trust funding. But when you do that, you won't lose assets to uh, legal fees and probate. The assets will go to your family in weeks rather than in months or years. And perhaps most importantly for some people, it's totally private. As I mentioned, they're easily changed and revocable living trusts are valid in every state. They're very difficult to attack. And here's an interesting concept. And that is that a revocable living trust is not a separate tax identity. You, the, uh, United States and your state do not tax the trust itself because it's revocable. The trust maker is taxed uh, with regard to the assets in the trust. So if you have uh, stocks that are paying dividends, if you have a bank account that pays interest, when uh, tax is paid on those, 
you're simply paid under the social security number of the trust maker rather than through the trust. The IRS views a revocable living trust as just transparent and because it's revocable. And that's a good thing because trust uh, tax brackets can be much higher than individual ones. So um, now you may ask though, we talked about guardians. Well, yes, you, you actually cannot name guardians in that revocable living trust. So when we do a trust for our clients, we actually also draft what's called a pour over will. It's a will where you, the primary purpose of which is to nominate guardians for minor children. But we always do these because it's possible that there may be some instance where some asset was not titled into the trust. And if that's the case, then the pour over will will take care of that with the residuary clause. And those assets that were left over, perhaps inadvertently, will be put into the trust. Uh, here, of course, this slide just talks about the very point that I just made. And uh, pour over wills can and are used with both revocable and irrevocable trusts. And uh, although that pour over will does have to go through probate, it still is not going to refer to uh, your entire uh, estate because most of your estate is going to be in the trust. And so it's still, your, 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 uh, your assets are still private. Your estate is still private. So these are things I think parents of children can sometimes worry about or ought to worry about. Uh, and that is that children may get divorced later and assets may go to strangers. Children could lose their inheritance to creditors or lawsuits it happens. Trusts avoid this. So let's give, take an example of uh, a couple of parents, Harry and Wendy, who have children, Denise, who likes to take selfies, and Homer. So here's Jason, Denise's husband. Uh, any inherited funds may be that Denise has, if she inherited through a will, may be commingled with other assets. And if they get divorce, divorced, Jason may get half. And if Homer accidentally leaves the water running in his bathtub in his apartment, then his neighbor may sue him and he might lose his inheritance, but that wouldn't be the case if those assets were in trust. Also, we talked about the fact that you can graduate um, bequests to your children uh, with a revocable living trust rather than leaving them everything when they become 18 years old. So in that sense, a children's trust is a little bit like a tube of toothpaste. It holds Sam and Denise's inheritance like a tube of toothpaste. They can squeeze a little bit money out of, of money out when they need it, but what remains is protected from lawsuits, from bankruptcy and divorce. Of course, when you do this, you're going to pick a trustee. It could be your adult child, but that will still give your, child, your children uh, protection because when your children inherit your assets, uh, that trust that they, that your, your children's trust is an irrevocable trust. And that trust uh, becomes a, a, an asset protection type trust. So let's talk about estate taxes. I'm sure almost everybody uh, has questions about that or you think about it. And it's true that if you die with more than a certain amount of money, your estate may have to pay estate taxes. Now, the good news is the, uh, that Alabama and Tennessee, the states I practice in, do not have an estate tax on any amount. Now, in this year, 2023, the year when I'm making this uh, webinar, individual estates valued at more than $12,920,000 are subject to federal estate tax. It's double that to almost $26 million for a married couple. 
Now that's that's a substantial amount, and only about one tenth of one percent of the states in the United States these days, because those amounts are so large, are subject to a state tax. But something you should know is that under the tax reform law that that raised these estate tax minimums to such high levels, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it expires uh, in 2026. And so before, after 2026, the, uh, the uh, minimal amount that is due to, re is due to revert to its pre-2018 level. And at that time, adjusted for inflation, the level will be $5 million per person. So any estate for an individual valued above $5 million will be subject to an estate tax after the federal estate tax after 2026 begins, uh, unless the law has changed. And we simply at this point have no idea whether it will. So let's talk about what the next steps are. If you have decided you do want to engage in some estate planning or that you really need to, if you've made it this far in this webinar, you probably do. What do you need to do? How do you make it happen? When should, you get, when should you get started? Well, you should get started now. And actually you have because you've watched this webinar. What's the investment of time to get it done right? Well, really just a few hours and not too many dollars. I should say this, before we talk about that. Uh, at the Gregory Law Firm, we don't bill by the hour for estate tax planning, estate and tax planning for estate planning. We don't do that. We instead bill flat fees. So you know exactly upfront what the cost is going to be. One thing you should think about, and I haven't mentioned this up to this point, but be careful about do-it-yourself or bare-bones trusts. It's possible that because they are just generic documents, they may not comply with state law. Uh, they have no ability to personalize the trust, and sometimes they may not be funded or they be, may be improperly funded because you don't have a, an attorney making sure that your trust is funded. When you work with an attorney for your estate planning, really paying for the attorney's guidance and counseling, not for the documents themselves. So the traditional, as I mentioned, the traditional way to do this, the traditional thing even estate planning lawyers do is to bill by the hour and make it transaction-based. But we don't do that. Ours is a flat fee, and we hope to be able to help you really all through your lifetime with your estate planning. So here's the process. You started it here with this webinar. The first step is to watch the webinar for people who do come in through the webinar process. Then second, we will hold what's called a design meeting where we actually roll up our sleeves and get down to the nuts and bolts of creating your estate plan. Then we will go and draft the documents and after we've done that, we will send you a document review video. We'll make any changes that need to be made. If there are some, some edits that need to be made, if we misspelled a name or something like that, we'll do that. And then we'll schedule a signing ceremony where we sign all the documents and you'll receive a bound copy of all your estate planning documents along with uh, an electronic copy as well. We were talking about uh, how estate planning lawyers work, really also talking about online documents. And this little drawing I thought was pretty, pretty telling. Uh, there's always someone who charges less, uh, somebody, on, uh, somebody that will just allow you to download a document from the internet charges less, no doubt. Do-it-yourself documents, really any document that you, get, that you get from the internet is a do-it-yourself document uh, that often doesn't go so well. So here's what we do for a basic estate plan that is will-based. We call that the silver plan that for, for a couple, these are all charges for uh, assuming that we're, we're billing 
for a married couple. Uh, the last will and testament package is $3,000. You also get with it, with that, all, what we call the ancillary documents, including a durable general power of attorney for both of you and, and uh, documents that uh, allow someone to make decisions for you uh, if you are unable to make decisions for yourself um, as well. Uh, the revocable living trust and the children's trust, that package is $4,500. Now, if you, and, and of course, the other ancillary documents go with that along with the pour over will. But now, if you also really do need estate tax planning, uh, then those packages can be uh, sort of custom tailored, but they would be in the range of $8,000 or more. So with the gold plan, you get all of these things, as I mentioned, the living trust, the pour over will, the children's trust, powers of attorneys, healthcare proxies, HIPAA waivers, uh, a living will, you'll nominate guardians, and then of course, we'll explain all your documents to you. We will give you instructions for how to transfer title to all your assets into the trust. If you want us to help with that, we can, but that's an additional, that if we actually do the funding for you or help you with it, that's, uh, uh, that's an additional fee. Well, of course, we'll give, we'll give you a certified copy of the trust. You may have to have that sometimes at a financial institution. We'll give you instructions for the successor trustee, final disposition instructions. We'll bind all this uh, in a binder and provide electronic copies. So the next step, if you watch this webinar, is a design meeting. Uh, and then we'll do the document review video, and then we'll talk about executing the documents. Booking that design meeting is easy. You can do it on the Gregory Law Firm website. There's a place at the bottom of the first page where you can find this Calendly link, and you can uh, book the design meeting. You can also book what we call a peace of mind planning session. Now, the peace of mind planning session is actually for people who have not seen this webinar. It essentially takes the place of the webinar for people who come in through some other means. If you want to book your design meeting the traditional way, you can just call uh, the phone numbers there. Of course, the phone numbers on the website uh, as well. Now, with regard to how we do the design meeting, uh, I need both, in, a, in, a, in the case of a, of a couple, both spouses must attend. There's a family profile or a questionnaire that you'll need to do before the session. I will send it to you uh, when you book your design meeting. Uh, it's a Word document, so you can just do it on your computer. And at the, at the design meeting, we'll discuss your goals. We'll answer all your questions. We'll make sure that all the right questions have been asked. We'll select an, uh, an estate planning package, either the, the will-based plan or the, or the uh, trust-based package, sign an engagement letter, of course, pay the fee at that time, and design your, your, your estate plan. So this is important that at the design meeting, that's where you do pay your attorney's fee because most of the work that we will do will be in that design meeting and afterwards. Now, if you uh, schedule your design meeting after you watch this webinar, tell me you watch the webinar and we'll give you $250 credit towards your estate plan. We do work with people who took the time to watch the webinar and, and know, uh, have some idea of what they're looking for. People who uh, don't presently have an estate plan or people who do want to update their current plan people who are ready to get started. Um, now, if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you're just looking for ideas, don't book a meeting with us. We're not appropriate for, for you. Um, if you're looking for a second opinion, also uh, probably that's not, it's not best for you. But if you're ready to move forward, that's, that's, that's the person we want to speak with. So as I mentioned, book your, book your design meeting, uh, and uh, uh, you can call or you can go on the website. 
I'm going to stop screen sharing now. So you'll just see me. And I appreciate your watching the webinar. Uh, if you have questions, like I said, or you want to book your design meeting, please go ahead and and uh, look at the website and and you can uh, find the uh, find the uh, place to do that. And in fact, I'll actually um, show you here uh, how you can do that uh, in just a moment and. Um, share that uh, share that um, share the web the website uh, with you if you'll give me just a moment I can do that and uh, so the website is here and here's the um, down at the bottom is where you can book the design meeting uh, by just clicking here, that's a link to what's called Calendly. So I appreciate your staying with me through the end and uh, look forward to working with you. Thanks.